Perfect. Thanks so much for clearing the way. I'm just excited to uh, have a little space to roam up here this morning. It's my uh, real hope and prayer that you can take me seriously this morning, despite the little caterpillar that's crawling across my upper lip. <laughs> I'm also really hopeful that it makes it to the video. It's not the most visible thing in the world, but <laughs> if it shows well, could be homepage of WBC material. I don't know. I will leave that in the hands of whoever makes those decisions. <laughs> I'm excited to be with you guys this morning. If you're new to WBC, if you're new uh, to Christianity and what this is all about, this morning's a great message for you, because uh, we're going to be talking about Jesus, uh, and that's why every single person is here. They're here because of Jesus, uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, something that's not really a mystery, it's right back up there behind me uh, on the screen, uh, that in Christ we're dead to sin and alive to God. So if, if you're new, welcome, uh, excited to share some of this with you. If you're not new, I just want to challenge you to have an open heart this morning. Because one thing, I don't know if you guys are guilty of this, I do this sometimes. Uh, oh, I know this. I'm dead to stand alive to God. I, I, I've known that you know, since I was a child. I grew up in the church. And it's, you know, maybe take a Sunday off. Check out, you know, read a little bit of what's going to happen, uh, some pregame analysis on the football for this afternoon. Don't do that. This message is powerful. If you engage with it, it's something that can have real transformative power in your life. It's something that can really take and, and shape uh, and move you uh, in the direction of, of where you want to be, which is being more like Jesus. Um, I guess the other thing that I just kind of want to mention, we're going to be in Colossians 2 this morning, so if you're in your pew Bible, I think that's page 834. Um, this passage that we're going to look at this morning doesn't exist in isolation. It really builds off of uh, what Gary spoke about a couple weeks ago. Uh, he did uh, the verses sort of just preceding where we're going to be this morning. And uh, if you weren't here for that message, I would really encourage you guys to do yourself a favor. Go home, uh, look up the sermon, and, and listen to what he had to say. Because what I have to say this morning very much builds off of that message. Uh, and he did a great job with this passage. So that's uh, my encouragement for you. And there's a whole bunch for us to talk about this morning. Uh, so we're just going to jump right in. Got a new clicker this morning, so just give me, oh, here we go. All right. Uh, we're going to start at Colossians 2, uh, verse 11 to 15. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Does that sound like we're going to have a good message this morning? I'm excited. It doesn't really seem like you guys are, but we're going to get there. So I, I guess the, uh, the first thing that we're going to just jump right into, verse 11, circumcision. In him you are circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Now, when you just toss a verse like that on the screen, Questions could be asked. Um, what we're talking about here, gentlemen, so that you're a little more comfortable, is an allegory. It's symbolism. We're not talking about a real physical thing that's going to happen to you this morning. And I think that gives us all some comfort. <laughs> Circumcision in the Jewish culture uh, was 
sort of a covenant that was established between Abraham and God at the founding of the nation of Israel. And it, it represents a whole bunch of things, but the main point, I think, is that someone who was circumcised, a man who was circumcised, was supposed to be set apart. That was the outward physical symbol that he was a member of God's nation, of God's family, of his people, that that man belonged to the nation uh, of Israel and to God's people. And that's not what we're talking about this morning. We're not talking about a physical sign because even in the Old Testament days, God's heart wasn't for a physical sign. God's heart has always been for the hearts of his people to be aligned with him, to long for relationship with him. It's not about the outward symbolism. It talks about in Deuteronomy, in Jeremiah, a circumcision of the heart that God really wants people set apart for him. He wants people to say, I'm setting myself apart to the Lord. And so circumcision was an outward physical sign of that. Uh, But here we're talking about it symbolically, and it sort of continues into the next passage. Um, And what we have in this next passage is that it talks about a new you. It says, your whole self ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Before you came to Jesus, you had an old self, and this old self is often talked about in Scripture as flesh, um, And what that means is it's talking about the inclination within you for rebellion. It's talking about unbelief. It's talking about that desire to live in sin and have a sinful life. And maybe you can really see obvious examples of that in your life before you came to Christ. Or maybe you haven't come to Christ yet and you're there and you're saying, yeah, that's that's me. I'm really struggling. I'm pretty rebellious against God. Maybe that wasn't the case. Maybe you think, you know, I got saved as a three-year-old. I was pretty sweet. I cried sometimes. Um, But I really wasn't rebellious. And that's just not true. Every one of us comes into this world and we're not aligned with God. We're not members of the family of God when we come into this world. We're rebellious against him. And what this passage is talking about is it's saying, when you come to Christ, he takes that old flesh, that old sinful nature, that desire for the self, that desire for your own self, your desire for sin, and he he cuts that out of you, and he replaces it with a new heart, a new heart that longs for him. He replaces it with his spirit, and this is the work of Jesus, and we read in other passages in scripture, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit is to transform your heart And another symbol of um, sort of new life uh, is connected here as well. It's baptism. A lot more comfortable talking about baptism. Um, And it's something that we're more familiar with, I think, in that you go into a, a baptism tank and you stand there and you're there representing your old self and they take you and put you under the water and that represents your death with Jesus. Jesus died so that your old self could die, so that you could be raised up and you could have a new life in him. And that's sort of what what baptism represents. You see these two symbols here. Uh, I think an important contrast to note is that in circumcision, it was performed, you know, when the child was was very young. uh, And there was a hope that as that child grew, that they would continue in the way of the Lord. That that child, having been marked as set apart, that their heart would follow God. That wasn't always the case. Sometimes it happened that way, but sometimes they received an outward physical sign and then nothing spiritual happened. And God spoke multiple times in the Old Testament about how 
what he really wants is for that heart change. And baptism is a little bit different. Baptism is still an outward physical sign, but baptism is an outward physical sign that happens after you've had your heart change. After this has taken place in your life, you get baptized to show what has been done for you. Not something that you hope will be done, something that has been done. So this is a kind of a cool passage to, to set the stage uh, for the rest of our message. And I just want to take a quick second to note that this is a passage that sometimes is used by people to say uh, different things about baptism, that it has a, a special level of importance or that like you're not a Christian if you're not baptized or there's these various ways that people can take this passage and, and misconstrue it. And we know from the entirety of Scripture that that's not true. Uh, we also see in this passage that's not, that that's not true. It says, you were raised with him through your faith in the working of God. Baptism is an outward symbol. What God cares about is your inward heart and what's happened in you. So if you haven't been baptized, uh, you're not missing out on some special level of salvation. You can't let anyone tell you that you're not saved. But I would also challenge you to get baptized. In Scripture, it's talked about. You get saved, you get baptized. It's not really a long pause as we sort of have in our, our culture today. If you know Jesus, if you profess him as your Savior, get baptized. Today's the day. Talk to someone. Uh, we can make that happen for you in short order, I'm sure. Uh, but just so you know, uh, it's not a special level of salvation. It's an outward physical sign. The next passage here uh, is incredible. It says that you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive with Christ. We're going to focus on verse 13 a little bit more uh, in a couple minutes. So we're just going to move on to even more incredible news uh, in the end of 13 and 14 here. It says that, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. That is fantastic news. I'm not hearing anyone clap. I'm not hearing anyone say amen. And I wasn't expecting to, let's be honest. But this is great news. This is just incredible. And one of the things I think that we, we love about God is that he's a just God. And I think we like that. We like our relationships to be based on justice. We don't want uh, relationships based on anything else. You know, If you can have a relationship with someone who's just, they'll be honest. Um, they'll be uh, intentional. They'll be firm. Uh, there'll be integrity there. That's the kind of relationship that you want. And that's a great quality that God has. But there's also a problem with God's justice. And it's not a problem for him, it's a problem for us uh, in that since the beginning, you know, since very shortly after we were made, the human race has been in rebellion against God. We said, God, no to you, yes to us, we're going our own way. And in this universe that God has created, there's a penalty for that rebellion. There's a penalty for that sin. And that penalty is death. And God is a just God. He will have his penalty. He will have his justice. There's no other way around it. And that's kind of terrifying. It's really weighty. Um, as I was preparing for this message, I read a whole bunch of things that were kind of terrifying in the just what that means, what the weight of God's wrath, what the weight of his condemnation, what the weight of his oh. anger means. And it's, it's tough. It's not something that you want to experience. You know, walking through the world, sometimes it can get pretty tough out there for us. It's not always a great place. It's sort of marred by sin. There's a lot of good stuff in the world as well. God made a good place. It's fallen and it's broken but there's still a lot of good out there. If we don't come to God, our eternal destiny is away from him and it's away from everything that is good. Everything that you know that's remotely good is from God. And it's not just a physical death 
that will die. It's a spiritual death that we die. We talk a lot about eternal life. I think we have a, a, a grasp on what that means, but if we're not walking with God, there's also an eternal death. That's separation from him and everything that's good forever. And that is weighty. That is tough. That's not something that's like, woohoo, let's go talk about that on a platform in front of 350 people on a Sunday morning. That's not exciting. It's terrifying. But the great news is that our just God, who demands a penalty, who demands death for our rebellion, he made a way in his love for us to be saved from that. See, just as one man, a guy named Adam, not me, brought sin into the world, one man who was sinful ruined it for everyone. But one man who was sinless can save everyone, and that's Jesus. Jesus came fully God, fully man, as Gary talked about previously, and he came and he took this penalty for us. When he got nailed to the cross, all of our sins got nailed there with him. There is no sin so small that he missed it, and there's no sin so big that he didn't cover it. Jesus took everything and he nailed it to the tree. I was hoping for an amen there, okay. I'll leave it with you guys, but just consider it. Work with me here a little bit, okay. That indebtedness, that price that we had to pay, that was paid by Jesus. That is absolutely incredible. Yes, here we go. (laughs) And this passage continues on. The good news doesn't stop there. We've talked about how God deals with our sinful nature, our flesh. He cuts it out of us. We've talked about how God deals with our sin. He paid for it. And now we get to talk about what Jesus did to the one who started the rebellion against him. Satan, demons, those are real. We have an enemy. When we were born, we were born into a conflict. We were born into a conflict between goodness uh, and darkness, between God and Satan. And that's been something that's been raging since the moment that Satan thought that he was better than God. And I don't think there was ever really a whole lot of doubt about how that was going to end, but on the cross, it was confirmed. Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities. There is no spiritual force that can tear you away from God. There is no way that the script is going to flip. There's no way that Satan gets the upper hand on God, or one day someone commits a sin that's so bad that Jesus can't pay for it. It's done. It's over. It's finished. They have no power anymore. Satan and demons are a defeated, surrounded army with no hope of victory. That doesn't mean there isn't danger there. That doesn't mean that it's something to take lightly. But in the big picture, it's over. And the next little piece here, I think, is just sort of a, an interesting inclusion. Uh, it's not something that... Um, you know, we ever really uh, think about too much, but I love this picture, that he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them on the cross. And it's a little bit aggressive. It's a little bit vicious. The language that's used here is sort of the language of humiliation, in that God, in his great power, could have dealt with this any way that he wanted to. He could have done it out of sight, out of mind. We would have never known about it. He'd take care of it. That would have been fine. But the message that sort of comes to mind for me is a little bit of like a, like a schoolyard scrap, you know? Like in high school, uh, every once in a while, you'd have a couple boys that wanted to tussle. And, uh, you know, sometimes you'd hear, oh, like, these two guys fought at the one guy's house 
and no one cared because it was like, oh, whatever. You know, Timmy punched Johnny and he says he won. Johnny punched Timmy, he says he won. Whatever, it doesn't matter. But if there was some real significant beef happening, it was, hey guys, we're going out behind Raph's Pizza in Elmira. <laughs> and you'd get like a couple hundred kids and everyone would go and you'd watch these two people fight. Probably not the best local tradition, but judging by some of the Snickers, I imagine that you have partaken or maybe viewed, who knows, um, it's one of these conflicts. That's what Jesus did. Jesus invited his enemies and he invited the whole world to watch and he stomped them. He finished it in full view of everybody so that there is no question who the victor is. And I think that's why we wear a cross. If you're a Christian, maybe you wear a cross, maybe you have it on a necklace, maybe you have a tattoo. Um, <laughs> I think that's why the cross is the symbol of Christianity. It's because that's where Jesus dealt with things. And now, the cross is a symbol of Christianity unless you have an automobile. Then it becomes a fish. That's just, make that clear right now. <laughs> this has been a lot of good news so far, right? Victory, victory, victory. Jesus just crushing. I'm going to ask the question that I'm sure some of you guys are asking right now. It's the question that really ripped me up the whole way through the preparation for this message. If there is so much victory, why do I struggle? You guys ever think this way? If Jesus has destroyed the power of my flesh, if he's paid for all my sins, if he's taken away my condemnation, if he's defeated the powers of sin and darkness and death, why do I struggle? It's hard. It's really difficult. And the answer uh, is that our defeated enemy fights on, so we must as well. There is no ultimate hope for sin, for darkness, for Satan, for demons, all of that is finished. They have no ultimate hope. But right now, that final victory is underway. And you'll know if you're a student of history that oftentimes the greatest battles, the hardest fights in a war are when that war is already over. When the enemy is surrounded on all sides and there's no hope of victory, but they aren't willing to lie down. That's where we're at right now. There's no hope for our enemy, but they're not willing to give up the fight, and so neither should we. I read a really uh, meaningful article uh, for me about this, uh, and I just want to share uh, some of the key points from there right now. Um, if you struggle, that conflict is normal. If you're here dealing with sin, you're here dealing with the same thing that everyone else here is dealing with. It's easy to sort of walk into church on a Sunday morning, look at all of you beautiful people, and imagine that you don't have any problems. Um, I don't know if I'm the only one that thinks that. But that struggle, that conflict is normal. If you're feeling this way, you're a Christian. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the family of God. We fight against sin together but you shouldn't feel like you're the only one. Uh, and the one piece of this for me that I found uh, really encouraging is that when God looks at me, he's never surprised by my sin. Sometimes I surprise myself. Have you ever had this conversation with yourself? Adam, what did you just do? How did you ever get here? You're supposed to be walking with God. How did you just do that? What's wrong with you? Has anyone ever been there? We surprise ourselves. We could be disappointed with ourselves. But Jesus isn't disappointed with you. It's not a surprise. He looked at you 
before you're even born. He knows every sin you've ever committed. He knows every sin you're going to commit today and for the rest of your life. And he looked at you and he said, I love you and I'm going to pay for it. There's nothing you can do that surprises God. He knows you fully and he still loves you. He still took that penalty for you. Now just because this conflict is normal doesn't mean that it's okay to lose. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to roll over and just allow sin to have its way in our life. Jesus broke the power of sin and death and there's nothing that binds us. Our battles against sin and death are winnable. He has given us all the tools. We've got the Bible. We've got his word in our heart. We're indwelt by the spirit of God. We have prayer. We have the community of believers. We have everything that we need to live a steadfast, faithful life to God. So that struggle with sin, it's normal, but it's not where you're supposed to stay. And are you always going to stumble until the day that you die? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be challenging, but you can grow in faithfulness and you can have a steadfast walk with Christ. He has given us everything that we need for that. And praise the Lord, this war is coming to an end. We already know the outcome, but one day we'll be free from all of it. And I'm so excited for that day. We'll be free of sin. We can walk in the presence of God. And we won't have any sin to speak of. We'll have perfect relationship with God, with each other, because there's no sin that's tainting it. And we'll be free from all the consequences of sin. I deal with chronic pain in my feet. I haven't taken a step for 15 years that hasn't rated somewhere between annoying and agonizing. I'm going to run when I get to heaven. I'm going to run free. I'm going to run free of my sin. And it's going to be amazing. This war is coming to an end, and it's coming to an end soon. And I think that sometimes that's where we leave this. This has been good news this morning. If we just drop this right here, that'd be pretty decent. Amen? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, but there's a whole other side to this. We've only got seven minutes and 30 seconds to explore it, but we're going to do it. We're not just dead to sin, we're alive to God. Do we spend enough time thinking about what that means? I know that I don't. That's what sort of gripped me and wrapped me up as I was preparing for this message, this piece about being alive to God. He has taken us and made us alive with him, and we have an eternal life that's amazing to look forward to, but he has called us to a deep, meaningful relationship with him right now. We're saved to a life of intimacy with God. You can have constant communion, communication with God. If you read the passage of John 15, talking about abiding, just that deep connection that you can have with God. You can have a life of power. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power. You can walk confident knowing that there is nothing that can oppose you, that there's nothing that can take you from the grasp of God, that you are loved by him, and there's nothing that can take that away from you. You can have a life of peace in this weary world, so corrupted by sin, so full of garbage, that just at the end of the day makes you exhausted. You can cast your cares on God and you have a hope a hope to look forward to knowing that we get to spend eternity with Christ I think oftentimes when we get stuck in our sin 
We're looking for this. We're looking for intimacy. We're looking for power. We're looking for peace. We're looking for hope. Those are available to us in Christ. Those are only available to us in Christ. There's nothing in this world that will give you any sense of this in a meaningful, permanent way. I just want to walk really quickly through Psalm 16. Uh, If you want to go there in your your Bibles, um, it's in the Psalms. I forgot to look up the page number. My apologies. Um, It's after 15, before 17. Um, It was written by David. And that was a man who really knew what it was to both have a heart for God, to be alive to God. He was called a man after God's own heart, and he knew what it was like to struggle with sin. So I'm just going to go through here and ask a couple of quick questions, and then I'm going to close. Um, Psalm 16, 1, keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. Do you take refuge in God, or do you take refuge in your sin? Because there's one of those places that's going to give you peace. It's not your sin. That's what we do. When we're scared, we run to something comfortable. That's not what David says to do. He ran to the Lord. Verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my God. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Do we believe that? Oftentimes, I feel like I have a lot of good things. I've got Jesus. I've got this. I've got that. I've got all these great things happening in my life. All of them are from God. The only good thing, the only thing worth pursuing with your whole heart, with your whole energy, with your whole life is Jesus. Do we believe that? That's what David is talking about here, that there is nothing good apart from God. Do we actually get that? I feel like we don't. I feel like the work of Satan in our culture is to convince us that everything other than Jesus is good. And he's done a pretty good job. Only Jesus is worth your time, your sacrifice, your devotion. Only Jesus, only God. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. I just want to ask a quick question. We don't have time to dwell on this, but one thing that I heard that really challenged me was that when your desire for God and the things of God, for prayer, for the Bible, for ministry, for worship, for Christian community, when those things are eclipsed by your desire for temporary pleasures of the world, namely anything else, your heart might be hard towards God. And that was a big challenge to me. I don't know your heart. I'm not pretending to. That hit me right square. Do I have a soft heart towards God, or am I focused on other things? Lord, you alone are my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. Would we be content with that? If all we had was Jesus, would it be enough? I will praise the Lord who keeps counsel. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. This was kind of interesting to me. David's talking about going to sleep and waking up feeling refreshed because he had been communicating with the Lord before he went to bed. And even as he sleeps, his spirit and the Spirit of God are communicating. He wakes up feeling refreshed. It, it says heart here, like the, the language that's used is maybe more translated like kidneys. Like it's talking about the counsel of the Lord coming up from within him. I don't know 
how you feel when you wake up in the morning. I don't feel like that. I would really, really like to. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. The idea of fixing your eyes on Christ comes up again and again and again in Scripture. And it's kind of a tired metaphor, but it's kind of like driving a car. If your eyes are fixed on a tree over here, pretty good chance that your car is going to be fixed to a tree in about three seconds. You've got to keep your eyes on the prize. You've got to keep your eyes on the road. Are our eyes fixed on Jesus? Are they fixed there? And he talks about living a life this way, and his heart is glad, and his tongue rejoices, and his body finds rest. This isn't a man who led an easy life, but he can have that joy. Do we have that? Do we want that? I think if we focus on God, if we give our all to God, that's what happens in our hearts. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. He knows that he is God's and he's secure forever. And he's looking forward there to Jesus. We have the benefit of looking back and seeing what he's done for us. Are our eyes fixed there? Are we remaining in that hope? And then finally, what we're saved to, we're saved to more than just a great life now because we can have that. We can have victory over sin. We can have communion with God. We can have that. But in eternity, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. We don't often talk about that. We get eternal pleasure with God. Why do we sacrifice a relationship with him for temporary pleasures now? The worship team's going to come up and we're going to sing some songs. I just want to encourage you guys to reflect back on this message. Um, Let's worship him for what he's done for us. Let's worship him for who he is and what he saved us from. Let's worship him and let's look into our lives and our hearts and let's ask him for the strength to live the life that's available to us now. He's broken the power of sin and death. Let's ask him for the power to live that way right now, today. If this message has touched your heart and you want to pray, you want to talk about things, I'll be up here uh, at the front afterwards. Don't go away. Don't leave this. Don't feel a pain in your heart and then just stuff it down and go away. Act on it. Today is the day. God is so good. He has saved us from so much and saved us too an amazing life with him. Thanks, guys.